this is the uh, the concept of the avatar but when you start thinking about it in detail all sorts of problems come up so that we'll discuss later on but this is what he is saying the divine teacher is the avatar himself okay. india has i am reading the sentence by sentence <laughs> india has from ancient times held strongly a belief in the reality of the avatar a descent into form the revelation of godhead in humanity okay. so even among ignorant people there are more intelligent people less intelligent people more sensitive people less sensitive people so this more and more can become absolutely a divine conscious being in the body so that can be the avatar basically the avatar avatri coming down let's see <coughs> the sanskrit um, the root is avatri three is to come down okay to cross and ava is coming down so you are coming down the divine is coming down into that which he has created himself into the darkness of the ignorance in the west this belief has never really stamped itself upon the mind because it has been presented through exoteric christianity now note that sir is very particular he is giving full credit to christianity for the esoteric part okay the esoteric part there are many many christian saints who have experienced the divine okay there are so many saints okay saint uh, <coughs> francis of assisi then there are many others then there was one in uh, north africa okay he in fact he went into philosophy also and there are so many others okay so they have all experienced it in in france also you have bernadette who actually saw the, uh, mother mary so there are so many so that is the esoteric the inner so same they saying the exotic christianity the outer christianity which is the body of laws and rules and theocracy built by christianity 400 years after christ huh? it's not christ who originated christianity it is the others who did that and earlier it used to be in rome then it shifted to istanbul in turkey and then it came back again into rome now you have the vatican which is there the center of the christian world right but they have got very uh, sharp ideas and they don't always correspond to truth one of the ideas which don't correspond to truth two ideas basically one is the avatar you can have a relation with the divine but you can't become the divine ever there is a book we have published in the um, clear ray trust which is a correspondence between amal and um, uh, 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 christian saint but who has who has accepted vedanta who has accepted the hindu way of, and he is based in tanjavur okay uh, griffith b day b e d e okay it's a very interesting book we have published the whole book his correspondence he doesn't agree with that the divine can become uh, the human being can become divine amal is going on arguing but they <laughs> never came to a conclusion so that is the christianity so this is one belief that they don't have and the other belief is reincarnation <laughs> reincarnation also they don't believe in <laughs> now slowly even scientific evidence is coming that reincarnation is actually a fact and how is that possible because of the internet the internet is giving you actual experiences of any number if you go to the internet you will see about 2000 cases are there of reincarnation <laughs> so there is almost induce indisputable evidence that there is incarnation reincarnation sorry okay so these are the two things that christianity doesn't believe in okay so same thing is very clear he is not all christianity but exoteric christianity as a theological dogma okay it's something made up by the mind it's not corresponding to reality dogma without any roots in the reason and general consciousness and attitude towards life but in india it has grown up and persisted as a logical outcome of the vedantic view of life and taken firm root in the consciousness of the race this is <clears throat> the divine can be here in the uh, in the physical world and it has gone to such an extent that anyone who is slightly superior to we worship them including even unfortunately even politicians <laughs> okay <laughs> we bow down to them we 
pamper them and we even uh, propitiate them. So this is something that is rare in India, beginning from the avatar root right down to the politicians also. And in that superior, we give full um, credit to them. So, so this is the, in India it is like that. Okay. All existence is a manifestation of God because he is the only existence. There is nothing else except the divine. And nothing can be except as either a real figuring or else a figment of that one reality. So there is including all the philosophies. It can be real, the physical world can be real or even if it's a figment of the reality, okay, an image of the reality, he is there even behind the image. Therefore, every conscious being is in part or in some way a descent of the infinite into the apparent finiteness of name and form, Nama Rupa. At the lowest level, you have all Nama and Rupa, the most outermost reality, name and form. Name has also no importance at all. We call things by their name. But you change the name, the thing doesn't change. Okay. <clears throat> I can call a, a stone, I can say stone, or I can say pathor, or I can say any other word. It doesn't change the reality of the stone. Exactly in the same way, I can call a tiger, a tiger, or I can call, in French, I can change the word and say tig. It doesn't change the reality. So name is exactly that. Even if all of you are there now, and you have a name, which your parents have given you, change the name, it doesn't make a difference to you. You are exactly what you were. So name and form is the na nature of the physical world and form. And that form also can change. Now note interestingly that in the physical world, form is relatively stable. It doesn't change very easily. It does change slowly, but it is not absolutely fixed, but it gives the impression of being fixed. But as you go, keep going higher and higher in consciousness, these forms become more and more subtle and less and less fixed. Even in the physical, in the vital world, these forms can be very, very variable. Then as you keep going higher and higher in the mental world, you have angels and all that, they can change their form. Okay. And you go to the gods also can change their forms. So that becomes the, but at the lowest level, name and form. But the divine can be there hiding behind the name and form. But it is a veiled manifestation. The divine is here, but he is veiled. Veiled by thick clothes, okay? The clothes of the body, the clothes of the vital, and the clothes of the mind. You have to get rid of all these veils, and then the divine becomes apparent to you. And there is a gradation between the supreme being. The supreme being, there is a footnote, Parabhava. He is again going into the Gita, okay. <clears throat> These are all words from the Gita. The veiled manifestation. There is a gradation between the supreme being at the highest level of the divine and the consciousness shrouded partly and whole or wholly by ignorance of self in the finite. At the highest level, pure divine. At the lowest level, hidden, hidden divine. He is there, but he is hidden. Okay, and note the word shroud. Okay, the word English word shroud means it is usually used for a, a cloth which covers a dead body. <laughs> so at the lowest level, it is almost dead. The consciousness is almost dead. Okay, shrouded partly or wholly by ignorance of self in the finite. The upper is the infinite, and the lower is the finite. The conscious embodied soul. Okay, that's why they he, the root word is they him. The one who has a body, who possesses a body, okay? He is the Dehi. Who is that? The Dehi is the soul. The soul possesses the body. Actually, at the lower level, it doesn't possess. Rather, the body possesses him. But as you keep going higher and higher, you realize that you have a body. You are living in that body. Dehin. Okay? The divine also pouring itself into the forms of the cosmic existence is revealed ordinarily in an efflorescence of its powers. Efflorescence, flowering, blossoming. Slowly, slowly, it reveals its powers. And that is the evolution that you have. 
first of all there is matter then there is slowly consciousness is revealing itself in the lowest forms of life then slowly the forms of life become more and more complex and more and more awakened and finally you have the human being and you can go beyond the human being you become a yogi and that yogi also can reach the status of an avatar so that's the gradation that he is talking about and efflorescence of power he is saying because in between there is the vibhuti the phenomenon of the vibhuti the difference between the avatar and the vibhuti is this avatar is fully conscious of the divine element in himself he knows that he is a divine whereas the vibhuti is one in whom the divine pours some particular powers but they are not usually conscious that they are divine the vibhuti okay <coughs> Shrendo calls uh, even uh, Napoleon a vibhuti because he was the first attempt to unify Europe. He did it through war, but that was the first attempt. And hundred uh, years later on, the European Union is now becoming a fact. So he started that movement. So he is a vibhuti. Uh, Vivekananda was a vibhuti. In fact, in the beginning, he was not conscious of his divinity at all. Okay, and he is gone. doubting everything vivekananda was a great intellectual he used to doubt everything but when he finally realized who he is he as he is himself told uh, one of his friends after death i have spat out the body in other words i have got rid of my the veil of the body <laughs> so i have spat out the body he told him and he escaped he wouldn't stay any more in the i am the divine why should i remain in the physical world <laughs> he vanished okay so <clears throat> that's a vibhuti the word vibhuti also is very interesting in sanskrit okay everything in sanskrit goes down to roots it's very interesting bhu to exist to manifest to come into become apparent okay and bhuti is the noun but vibhuti is v means many separation so the divine manifests himself in many powers and one of those powers can be a man who is a vibhuti the difference between avatar and vibhuti is this avatar is fully conscious of himself is it possible for an avatar to be half conscious of his divinity said there is a very interesting case about chaitanya mahaprabhu okay chaitanya mahaprabhu used he said the calls him a partial avatar because sometimes he is to behave like a, a sadhak he is to pray he is to he is to uh, behave like a, a seeker but there are other times when he is to behave like the lord himself okay he is to his whole appearance is to change and when people used to come he is to bless them and he is to he knew that he is the supreme so he is a partial avatar so the phenomenon of avatar as we see we will see later on is quite complicated it's not very easy at what point does the avatar become conscious of his own divinity is one of the questions that is pretty troubling <laughs> okay so but ultimately when the human being realizes that he is essentially divine then that's the avatar and he can do the work of an avatar in the physical world <laughs> there are two three chapters on the avatar later on we will see that okay so that's what he is saying so now i read the last sentence <laughs> the divine also pouring itself into the forms of the cosmic existence is revealed ordinarily in an efflorescence of its powers in energies and magnitudes of its knowledge love joy it can be any of these a developed force of being it can also be force in degrees and phases of his divinity it's not only one thing there can be degrees there also gradation is very important but when the divine consciousness and power taking upon itself the human form and the human mode of action possesses it possesses the body mind life okay not only by powers and magnitudes by degrees and outward phases of itself but out of its eternal self knowledge when the unborn knows itself who is the unborn the divine because he is never born he is permanent so your soul also is when you realize that you are the pure soul you become the unborn aja is the word used in the gita 
knows itself and acts in the frame of the mental being. Okay? The frame is the, the body, the house, and you are acting, living in that house of the body, mind, life. And the appearance of birth, it's only an appearance because he, he doesn't depend on his body, mind, life. That is the height of the conditioned manifestation. Not the word, conditioned manifestation. Manifestation in the physical world, not fully. It's always conditioned. What is it conditioned by? It's conditioned by the body, mind and life. It is subjected to the laws of the physical, laws of the vital world and laws of the mental world. It is the full and conscious descent of the Godhead. It is the avatar. So, in 1926, when Sri Krishna himself descended into the very body, not the consciousness or not the head, not the throat. Some yogis, they feel the divine presence and the light only in the mind. Some, they feel the light coming down right up to the, uh, the throat. Some feel it coming down even into the heart. And some go, it goes down even to the lower vital. But in Sri Ramadha's case, it went right down into his legs. The golden light came and even occupied his legs. So you are fully divine. You are having a body, but you are fully divine. The consciousness is fully divine. That's the avatar. Okay? <laughs> now we read the next one. Note the, mm, the next para that we are going to read. Okay? When the unborn knows itself and acts in the frame of the mental being. This is very important. When you realize that you are the divine, you become the avatar. When the unborn knows itself and acts in the frame of the mental being and the appearance of birth, that is the height of the conditioned manifestation. So, this is the question that he asks and he will answer the question in the next para. The Vaishnava form. Yeah. Uh, who you? I'll read. Yeah, go ahead. The Vaishnava form of Vedantism, which has laid most stress upon this conception, expresses the relation of God in man to man in God by the double figure of Nara Narayana, associated historically with the origin of a religious school very similar in its doctrines to the teaching of the Gita. Nara is the human soul which it which eternal companion of the divine, finds itself only when it awakens to that companionship and begins, as the Gita would say, to live in God. Narayana is the divine soul always present in our humanity, the secret guide, friend and helper of the human being, the Lord who abides within the heart of creatures of the Gita. When within us the veil of that secret sanctuary is withdrawn, and man speaks face to face with God, hears the divine voice, receives the divine light, acts in the divine power, then becomes possible the supreme uplifting of the embodied human conscious being into the unborn and eternal. He becomes capable of that dwelling in God and giving up of his whole consciousness into the divine which the Gita upholds as the best or the highest secret of things, Uttamam Rahasyam. When this eternal divine consciousness, always present in our human being, this God in man, takes possession partly or wholly of the human consciousness and becomes in visible human shape, the guide, teacher, leader of the world, not as those who living in their humanity yet feel something of the power or light or love of the divine gnosis in forming and conducting them, but out of that divine gnosis itself, direct from its central force and plenitude, then we have the manifest avatar. The inner divinity is the eternal avatar in man. The human manifestation is its sign and development in the external world. Yeah. That last sentence is very interesting. Okay, yeah. The inner divinity is the eternal avatar in man. Okay, even you are an avatar because the divine has descended into your body mind life. So, but you are a potential avatar, not yet fully avatar. But when you become conscious of your divinity, you are an avatar. So, very interesting para, and we'll have a look at that. Okay. So, the Vaishnava form of Vedantism. Vaishnava form coming from the word Vishnu. So you worship the Krishna aspect of the 
Krishna was a, a manifestation of the of Vishnu. So that's why the Vaishnava form. The um, worship and adoration of Krishna. Okay. The Vaishnava form of Vedantism, which has laid most stress upon this conception, expresses the relation of God in man to man in God. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. So, note the word. Express the relation of God in man to man in God. Okay. So, God is there in all human beings. Okay. In, he is there even in the stone and the mm, caterpillar. But there is absolutely, he is totally hidden there. But in human beings, he is hidden, but he can be revealed. He can be revealed. So, expresses the relation of God in man to man in God. Okay. By the double figure of the Nara Narayana. Nara Narayana, you are Nara so long as you identify yourself with your body, mind, life. You become Narayana when you identify yourself with your soul. Okay, So you are both. You are the human being as well as the divine. Okay? Associated historically with the origin of a religious school, very similar in its doctrines to the teaching of the Gita. In other words, he is saying, that the mm, uh, Vaishnavism is a little different from the Gita. He does, he's saying very similar to the doctrines of the teaching in the Gita. It is a worship of the uh, yeah. So now there is a whole movement that has been carried on from this Vaishnavism, the ISKCON consciousness in the movement. It's gone all over the world. <laughs> ISKCON. Um, International Society for Krishna Consciousness or something like that. Okay, And they shave their head. There are plenty of uh, such uh, organizations in uh, America and Europe also. The Krishna Consciousness <laughs> is called. So, that's it. So, you are Nara as well as Nara. Associated historically with the origin of a religious school. Very similar. I think it was the Chaitanya movement that brought about the Vaishnavism. Okay. The, the worship of Vishnu. And then in India, we have the worship of Vishnu on one side, Vaishnavism, and we have the worship of Shiva on the other side, Shaivism. <laughs> and they are often at loggerheads. <laughs> okay, so. <clears throat> the uh, Nara is a human soul which the eternal companion of the divine. Uh, I'll tell you, he will, he will himself say later on, but it, he compares it to a, a chariot in which the Indra is a driver and you are also sitting in it. Okay. There is a image in the Veda of the Kutsa, Kutsa riding in a chariot with Indra. And Kutsa is a human being and Indra is a divine being. And they go they are going in a chariot, and that's a journey, the journey of yoga from ignorance to knowledge, from finiteness to infiniteness. And finally, when they reach their destination, Kutsa has become almost similar or exactly similar to Indra. So that is the description of the avatar. When the human being becomes fully aware of his own divinity, he becomes the avatar. Nara Narayana. Narayana is the divine soul always present in our humanity. Just see that. Even in the criminal, <laughs> the murderer he is there. Okay? That's what Sri Ramana saw in jail. <laughs> he is seeing Sri Krishna and everybody. Okay, so. Narana is the divine soul, always present in our humanity. The secret guide, friend and helper of the human being. The Lord who abides within the heart of creatures. He has put that in uh, double quotes because it's on the Gita. Chapter 18, verse 15. No, sorry. Uh, verse uh, 60, 61. Okay. Ishvara Sarva Bhutanam Hriteshe Arjuna Tishtati Brahmayan Sarva Bhutani Yantra Rudhani Mayaya. So the divine is seated in the heart of everybody and moving the body mind life like a machine. And also in chapter 15, also there is one Sarvasya Chaham Hridi Sannivishto Mattaha. Then that's the one that is also there, okay. Smriti Jana Mohan. I can't read the what I have written, it's not very clear. 
Okay, so these are the two references from the Gita. So we go on to the next. <clears throat> when within us the veil of the secret sanctuary is withdrawn, the veil is your material veil, the vital veil, and the mental veil. When the veil of the secret sanctuary is withdrawn and man speaks face to face with God, hears the divine voice, okay, sees, receives the divine light acts in the divine power, then becomes possible the supreme uplifting of the embodied human conscious being into the unborn and eternal. He becomes capable of that dwelling in God and giving up his whole consciousness into the divine, which the Gita upholds as the best or highest secret of things. Uttamam Rahasyam. The Rahasyam, the highest secret. The highest secret is man can become the divine. Mm -hmm. When this eternal divine consciousness always present in every human being, this God in man takes possession partly or wholly of the human consciousness and becomes in visible human shape, the guide, teacher, leader of the world, not as those who living in their humanity yet feel something of the power or light or love of the divine gnosis, informing and conducting them, but out of the divine gnosis itself, direct from its central force and plenitude, then we have the manifest avatar. He is talking of the partly and the wholly. We just now spoke about Chaitanya. There is a footnote there. Chaitanya, the avatar of Nadia, is said to have been thus partly or occasionally occupied by the divine consciousness and power. So, he calls him a part avatar. If you define the avatar as a human being who is fully conscious of his divinity, then he is an avatar. A yogi is not always fully conscious of his divinity. He, he, he accepts the divine light comes into him, the divine power comes into him, the divine knowledge comes into him. Okay. The divine ananda also may come into him, but he is not fully conscious that he is divine. So he is a, a yogi, but he is not an avatar. Okay, so this is the when that happens. Now look very carefully here. Sriamdu is it would apply very well to himself. Okay, so when this eternal divine consciousness, which is always present in every human being, this God in man takes possession partly or wholly of the human consciousness and becomes in visible human shape. He becomes a guide, a teacher, or the leader of the world not as those who living in their humanity yet feel something of the power of light or love or the divine gnosis. This refers to the any yogi. Okay? He feels the power or light. Or, is, that's not the avatar. Informing and conducting them, but out of that divine gnosis itself. Divine gnosis, it has to be the supramental. Direct from its central force and plenitude, then we have the manifest avatar. In his case, very clearly, he was in touch with the super metal and the Shri Krishna himself descended into his body. So, obviously, he is the avatar. If you apply this, then there is a whole book. A, 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 Hindi, a gentleman has written a book in Hindi. I think it's also translated into English, giving all the quotations from Sri and Mother, where the indications are clearly that yes, Sri is an avatar. He never declared himself to be the avatar. Okay. <laughs> there is a very interesting joke about this avatar. In the evening talks, okay, I think I told you once, in the evening talks, there was a reference to a conversation between two sadhaks. One sadhak was saying, Shri is the avatar. And the other sadhak was saying, no, he is not the avatar, but he is a very high um, yogi, very developed yogi. So they had a fight <laughs> and they even came to blows. <laughs> okay. They even came to blows. So this was reported to Srirandu. And Srirandu, with a sense of humor, is saying, after he got the beating, did he accept me as an avatar or not? <laughs> <laughs> so Srirandu, sense of humor, even at that. <laughs> so this is, if you are fully conscious that you are divine, yes. In fact, uh, Mona has written a book also, 
uh, where the mother tells him that I know that I am the supreme mother. Now, I don't know if he should have published that <laughs> because to make mother herself say that I am the avatar, that is something which is uh, uh, for public consumption, it can be misinterpreted. But anyway, we know that she was the supreme divine mother. In fact, Sri Ramadha also told her that. Okay, so. so, this is the avatar. The definition of avatar is not the divine, but the human being who becomes divine. A human being who realizes that his consciousness is fully divine and is open to the divine, that is the avatar, not the vibhuti or the yogi. That's what he said. So, we have 10 minutes more. So, we can read the... So, very clear definition of what the avatar is. The avatar is a human being into whom the divine has descended and he becomes fully conscious of his divinity. That's the avatar. Okay. It's very interesting uh, whether Ramakrishna was an avatar or not. He himself declared himself to be an avatar because he said, but Sri Ramdu, when the question was referred to him, I don't think there's any very clear statement by Sri Ramdu that Ramakrishna was an avatar. Okay. But Ramakrishna himself said that. He said, Jai Ram, Jai Krishna, Shai Ramakrishna. Okay. That was his own words. He said, Jai Ram, the one who was Ram, the one who was Krishna, he himself is Ramakrishna. But, but that doesn't mean he says he's an avatar. He's saying that the consciousness of Ram or Krishna is within him. That doesn't mean that he is an avatar. No, according to what Shrivinder has written about avatar, that you act in that uh, knowledge, that may be not possible. Okay. Was Krishna an avatar or not? Yes. He was an avatar. Ram also was an avatar. Yes. So he is saying that the one who was Ram and, and Sri Krishna, he is the same Ramakrishna. No, but that anybody can say, no, like in, in within me there is Ram, there is Krishna, but that doesn't mean that I am avatar. Avatar well, is one who acts according to that, but uh, he doesn't say that I am acting according to that. No. If you read his life, you will see that he used to very often act like that. Okay, so <clears throat> you will see that he was. So it's a question of. Uh, what you believe in and what, but these are his words. You can interpret as you want, okay? But these are his words. Jai Ram, Jai Krishna, Shai Ramakrishna. Okay, so we can, I think, read one more parana when we thus understand the conception. You know, uh, since you are saying that he did not act like that, there are many, many interesting cases where uh, I'll give you only two things, okay? One is he saw the divinity in Vivekananda and Vivekananda was a college student at that time and Vivekananda did not know that he is the divine. He, in fact, he was a very uh, intellectual. He was even a disbeliever. So, he used to go about asking everybody in uh, Calcutta, have you seen God? Apne ki Bhagavan ke he used to go on asking everybody. But when he asked that to Ramakrishna, he said, yes, of course, I see him more concretely than I see you. Hmm. I see him and he touched him on his center forehead. Okay. Now that's the action. The moment he touched him on his forehead, okay, <laughs> he started losing consciousness of the physical world and he got frightened and he said, Don't, 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 no, don't, don't do this to me, don't do this to me. I have got a family at home, I have got responsibilities. So uh, Ramakrishna said, Okay, okay, it is not yet time. The time will come when you'll realize who you are. So he did act in that way in many, many cases. So, just by a touch. Okay, we read the next one. When we thus understand. I think, Pallu, you can read the next one. When we thus understand. When we thus understand the conception of avatarhood, we see that whether for the fundamental teaching of the Gita, our present subject, or for spiritual life, generally the external aspect has only a secondary importance. Such controversies as the one that has raged in Europe over the historicity of Christ would seem to a spiritually minded Indian largely a waste of time. He would concede to it a considerable historical but hardly any religious importance. For what does it matter in the end whether a Jesus son of the carpenter Joseph was actually born in Nazareth or Bethlehem? 
lived and taught and was done to death on a real or a trumped up charge of sedition so long as we can know by spiritual experience the inner christ live uplifted in the light of his teaching and escape from the yoke of the natural law by that atonement of man with god of which the crucifixion is the symbol if the christ god made man lives within our spiritual being it would seem to matter little whether or not a son of mary physically lived and suffered and died in judea so to the krishna who matters first is the eternal incarnation of the divine and not the historical teacher and leader of men yeah so this is he is talking about the <coughs> avatar hood of christ and the avatar hood of uh, uh, krishna you can actually experience them as reality okay and it will still be christ who you are experiencing and still krishna who are experiencing so it, whether they lived or not or whether they were uh, historicity he is challenging the historicity that is absolutely in fact there is a, um, a thoughts and aphorism there is one that there are four things which were doubt, historicity is doubted na so I forget the exact one, but I think I'll next time I'll try and get you that one. There is a four things which are doubtful <laughs> about history, and yet they have influenced the uh, evolution of man in a very very solid manner. One was the existence of Christ. The other was the um, uh, uh, existence of the Troy. I think the Trojan War, and the other is the Kurukshetra. So all this he says that. It, it has completely revolutionized mankind so whether it is real history or not matters little that's basically what he's saying okay so actual experience is the important point not the historicity that's basically what he's saying okay so <clears throat> we have 3 minutes only so the next one is a very big para is slightly more than a page more so than a page. yeah tell me So we'll go through this next time with this para. I think so because as a we'll go through next time and freshly discuss it. I think we can stop today, na? No? So, so, uh, so according to Sri Ramdev, he goes on mentioning Christ, Buddha, and um, Sri Krishna as avatars. Okay. And you can't. Sri Ramdev could have no doubts about Krishna because Krishna himself was guiding him in jail as well as in in 1926. He himself descended into Sri Ramdev, <laughs> so there is no question of him doubting Krishna. Okay, that's what he is saying. Whether he existed historically or not is not the point. Okay, we'll read this next time. In seeking the kernel of the thought of the Gita, we'll read that next time. Grandada. Ah, tell me. Question. It is out of our book that in the temples they give vibhuti, you know. Then why they name it as a vibhuti? Uh, in you... South Indian temples, in South yeah. Indian temples, uh-huh. they give vibhuti. So ashes as vibhuti, no? Oh, acha acha acha. Okay, okay. Ah, uh, that's something that I'm not sure about. I'll have to think about it. Uh, but in Sanskrit, okay. any word that you take okay that's a very very interesting thing in the sanskrit language of course the etymology is there in every language but not as clearly as in sanskrit in sanskrit you start with one word and then you go on go on go on this means this this implies this this implies this and finally you come to something almost opposite okay so your question is a very interesting one vibhuti i'll do one thing <laughs> i'll check the dictionary and we will see its various meanings in sanskrit one word can mean many many things of course in english also it's like that but in every language i am suppose i suppose it is like that but in sanskrit it is very logical the etymology is extremely logical so from that point of view if you see vibhuti okay so that it becomes bhuti is existence bhu bhu is to exist then bhuti is existence and vibhuti it takes many forms so even the ashes are divine in essence okay because it's a vibhuti <laughs> so, 
So it could be interpreted that way, that even the divine is there, even in that ash. <laughs> the ash is something resulting from the death of something. Okay. If you burn down something and you get the, so that's the lowest form. So even in the lowest form, there is a divine. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, it could be that, like that. You could interpret it that way. Okay. The ashes are something that result from usually the burning and the non-existence of something. So the non-existence, even there the divine is there, vibhuti. And that's why they use the vibhuti also as a, uh, as, as a, uh, carrying the divine power, you know? <laughs> There's a very interesting joke also about that, okay? <clears throat> Someone had sent a telegram uh, to Sirindu saying, I seek your Arshish. Now, Arshish yes. means blessings, you know? But in the English, that Arshish became ashes. A-S-H-E-S. <laughs> And Shiv had a great amount of fun. He said, oh, he's asking for ashes. Okay, <laughs> you can send him <laughs> my cigarette ashes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, it's interesting that even in English, Ashish can become ashes. <laughs> so, <laughs> if, if you apply that to the word Vibhuti, again, there's a parallel. <laughs> <laughs> instead of I as E. Yeah, that's right. In the telegram, it became like that. So they had a lot of fun about that. <laughs> He's asking for ashes. Okay, send him the. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, see you next time. Okay. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, Agada. Thank you, Agada. Thank you, everyone.